Hey, it's Mark Podolsky at Land Geek, the favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. This week's topic is what business are we really in? And so oftentimes you'll start a business and you'll think, oh, this is my business. And then you realize later, wait, no, there's this constraint. And based on this constraint, this is really the business. We have almost all the usual suspects for this week's podcast. We've got Kirk. No nickname parrot yet. Kirk, how are you? I'm good, Mark. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. We got Dude Buddy, the nightcap OG. Scott Boston. Scott, how are things? Things are going well, Mark. Thank you. Good to see you. We've got Landon, the aquatic investor, AI Harris. Landon, how are you? Oh, oh right off the gray. Right off the gray. <laughs> Nice. And last but not least, I love it when you call me Big Papa. Hey, Litchfield. Hey, how are things in Sin City? Doing well. Yeah, uh, things are good. It's hot, man. It's really hot. All right. Well, we've got an interesting topic. What business are we really in? So here's an example. Let's say that you're a law firm and you start off your law firm and you think I'm in the business of providing legal services. And then you realize in time, as you start to grow your law firm, you're like, no, that's not the business I'm in. The real business I'm in is I'm in the business of retaining top legal talent. And the focus is really on recruiting, retaining, creating a structure. That's why most law firms are limited liability partnerships because they have partnerships. Because if they don't have, if your, if your law firm doesn't have uh equity for these partners, they'll just take clients and they'll go and leave and do their own thing. So the real constraint to growing a law firm is attracting, retaining legal talent. So for the land business, what is our business? When we first start, we think our business is buying and selling raw land. So we're always talking about the M&Ms. It's mailing and marketing. But as you grow, you start to learn, okay, there's a new constraint here. And really, I'm in the business of blank. So, Kirk Parrott, what is the real business we're in? What is our constraint as we grow, as we scale? Yeah, this is a really, really awesome and interesting subject because I've been thinking about this a lot too, actually. And I, I think about the journey, right? So when I started the land business, I definitely feel like I was in the acquisition business. It was all about getting the product. Couldn't have it. Right. So it was it was acquiring the land. Um, now a few years later, I really feel like I am in the the automation and marketing business. So, you know, I really am working hard to automate as many systems as possible. And that's automation with people as well. So it's people plus systems. So that we can do the thing of telling everybody we got land to sell, put that in front of as many people as possible and let the machine do the rest of the work. I love it. I love it. The automation and marketing business. Fantastic. Well, dude, buddy, Nightcap OG, what, what's, what's your business? What's the constraint? The constraint. Well, <clears throat> so <clears throat> as we mentioned earlier, I think Every business has phases, right? And I look back to when I first started this, and um, I would say my business was about survival, um, like trying to survive my day with working 50 hours a week, trying to grow a business, trying to keep food on the table for four boys. And each land deal man felt like, oh, it's just taking a little bit of pressure off me this month, maybe a little bit more off this month, right? And uh that that survival phase is what kept me going the first year right and it was my burning desire for keeping going and it's interesting cuz i've been doing this almost 9 years now and it has definitely transitioned right i look at the from one extreme to the other i look at that and now i look at today and it's more like Kirk said system right it's more like um you know uh brand how to build a better brand. Uh, to me, it's more about helping more people now, 
than ever before. Like, how can we help people on the buy side? Because there are a lot of people out there that that we help, right? And you wouldn't think right. that, but it's we're we're buying land for twenty five thirty cents on the dollar, and you wouldn't think you get thank you cards in the in the mail or positive reviews, but you do. So now it's transitioned over a little bit to less survival for me because we're doing much better and more about growth in those other areas. And the constraint right now, I guess, I think the constraint is, um, I don't really know. I think it's, I think it's kind of money because like there's so much land I could buy right now. It's crazy. So I got to be always thinking where I get the money, where I get the money, where I get the money. And uh, that's cool too, because that's just completely different thinking than it was nine years ago. Because I, I didn't think I could find it anywhere else. So now it's just a matter of finding it. Yeah. So you're you're ultimately in the money business now. Yeah. You're you're in the business of constantly raising money and structuring deals to continue right. to buy land. That's super interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I, I think it's. You know, just going on a quick tangent here. I think it's really interesting to bring up the thank you notes when we buy land, because I think in different real estate markets, people really don't feel good about what they're doing. You know, let's pick on a wholesaler. Um, you know, they're they're looking for someone who's desperate to sell their house, and they're not really adding any value in that transaction. They're just the middleman. It's like, okay, I'm going to send out ten thousand offers. I'm going to find some desperate people. I'm going to negotiate a deal. I'm going to flip it to somebody who's actually going to go in and then add value to that house. And I'm just making money as the middleman. And yeah, it, I'm sure there's a way to for them to justify some value in it. But ultimately, it probably doesn't feel that great because that person who's selling on that house, they're in a really desperate situation. And it's a house, their house. It's very emotional. Where when it's raw land, we're helping somebody who's taken an asset that was now it's a liability for them. We're really helping them. And all along the chain of value, we're helping people because now that person may not even be paying their property taxes. Now we're gonna find somebody who pays the property taxes, helps that county build schools and roads and hospitals and, and do all those things. And then when you sell it, you're helping somebody get an asset. That lasts forever, nothing maintain, nothing protect. And, and they can enjoy the land, they can improve the land, and the taxes are cheap. It's not going to be a financial burden for them if they don't want the land. So I think it's a good reminder for people when they think about this niche and you know their big why. Like it just feels good. Like let's let's reevaluate. Like, why are we doing these things? Why are we in business? Well, it's to add value to people's lives. And you know, so we're getting really geeky about well, how can we do it at scale, and what's our constraint? But ultimately, I think it's a really good reminder to get back to that fundamental reason of like, why are we even in business? Um, that could be another podcast roundtable. Why are we in business? What is our real business? Landon AI Harris, what business are you in? So you know, it's interesting. Um, it's an interesting topic. Um, Scott brought up something that was kind of really kind of important because you do go through these phases of, of when you're in this business for a while. And I would probably say if currently we're in the, I, I look at it as notes. We're managing notes. So we're managing the people that we already have currently uh, signed up, you know, that have already said, hey, I want to buy this land and we are managing the notes. So we're going through a lot more, some defaults, but you know, hey, let me give you a call. Let me talk to you. Let me see if we can work this out. And so we try to help folks kind of make, you know, make their payments better, or do we need to bring this down and, and work this out with you? So that's a little bit more of where we are. But at the same time, when I say notes, we're looking at growth. How, how do we grow bigger? How do we grow more? And so, you know, I have this considered, well, now, do I take the notes that I have, sell them off, and maybe bring in some more capital to kind of manage the business a little bit better? So I I put it in terms of notes, but maybe it's just financial. You know, it's it's financial manager is what we become in some respects. Um, you look at how can you make this business grow and be better, but 
you still don't want to lose what you're true to and what this business really began about. But like I said, I think it's more for us at this current stage about finances and managing your notes and what do you do with them? You know, um, what do you do with your current clients and what do you do with your current business? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I have a thought about that, but it looks like Kirk has a thought. Kirk, what was your, what are you thinking when, when Landon was saying about that? No, I, I mean, I, I like that in the sense that you do, when you get a nice portfolio of notes, you do a lot of note management, right? You do the folks, you know, if we're really in this, if part of what we're doing here is to help folks, right? We say here that we always have, we have a mission to help everyone who wants to buy land, actually buy land, right? Um, and some of the folks that we, we have as customers aren't the best with managing their money. So I know, you know, just like what Landon was saying, we do a lot as far as trying to get in touch with people if they miss a payment, help restructure stuff for them um, if they need it in order to help them get to that end goal of actually owning the property. So yeah, note management is definitely a big piece of, of what you do. But then I also really like um, what Scott said, because, uh, and you and I, Mark, even had a, a bit of a conversation about this. I do think that at some point in time, you just, you just got to start. You get to the point where you just to keep the flow going, got to go become a, a person that raises money. Like, and that for me has been sort of uncomfortable. And uh, I'm, I'm working to push through that wall because I think it is the key to keep scaling the business. And I mean, it's kind of obvious from our conversations that that's the key for sure. No, absolutely. Tim, what, what were your thoughts when Landon was talking about note management? And being yeah, I mean, if somebody were to ask me what I do, I would tell them that I'm in the lending business. You know, that's how I would summarize everything that pretty much all these guys have mentioned is in the note management business. But really, if you boil down to what we're doing, we're in the lending business. I'm going to lend something to you in exchange for USD, US dollars, right? And here's the way that we're going to do this. So my job is as a lender is to figure out what's the best price I can give you on said asset and get the best return on my money, right? And sometimes it's a home run and sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes we get on first base, but I'm in, I'm in the lending business is what it boils down to. We are managing assets and lending, uh, lending, you know, lending things out in the form of land. That's what we lend. And hopefully you get to buy. I'm no different. Yeah, so, than yeah, yeah. So, so Tate, is that your business then? You're, you're a bank, essentially is what you're okay. saying. That's you're how I would so you're so you, but it, what is your constraint then? So the, so the real business is the way you look at it is I'm a, I'm a land bank in, in a sense. Like I'm not, I'm not lending out dollars. I'm lending out Correct. land. Correct. So my constraints would be, um, you know, capital is going to be a constraint no matter where you're at in the business. You can always have more money uh, to buy more. You can always have uh, more people knocking on the door to buy land from you. So my constraints are, you know, inventory, i.e. capital and uh, marketing. And both of those problems are solvable problems where I have to weigh them is whether or not I want to do the work to solve those problems. And here's where I think people often forget is like, look, my lifestyle is great. It's awesome. Making an extra blank dollars every single month might not be worth it right now. And so for me, I'm weighing that responsibility of, you know, living up to uh, our shareholders or my quote unquote fiduciary obligation, right? While also trying to manage the lifestyle that I've built so hard to, be, to, to live. So I am in the lending business and my main constraint is, uh, you know, how much do I want it, right? I want it bad right now. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm willing to sacrifice a lot because I want it bad. I, I'm hungry still. Don't let anyone, you know, tell you otherwise. I'm a bulldog, man. I want, I want it bad. So I, I, yeah, dude, buddy, what are your thoughts about that? Do you, now, now that you've heard all the answers, do you feel like you want to change your answer? And like, um, you're in the banking business. Oh, I mean, I think I, you know, I think I definitely am in the money business. I mean, we're just moving money around in the most efficient way possible. Money and assets, right? I'm an asset manager, I guess. Maybe that'd be another. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we're in the asset management business. I think we're also in the people business. 
in the sense mm-hmm. that what Landon was saying, um, and Scott, what you were saying is we want to have good a good customer experience on the front end when we're buying that piece of property and on the back end when we're managing that notes. We want to make sure that customer continues paying on that note. And then uh, to Tate's point, like we're a bank essentially. And what is what does the bank do? They manage money. And so how do they make money? They got inflows and they got outflows. And our outflow is essentially selling uh, an asset that lasts forever that people pay on each month and we get a yield. And so uh, I was talking to Landon about this uh, the other night. If, if you can make a spread on that yield like a bank, well, that's a really good deal. And for other people, they might be looking at, well, I don't want debt or I don't want to give up equity. And Tate and I talk about this all the time. Like we think, well, if you don't want debt and you don't want to do an equity deal, it's really easy. Sell a property on easy terms, sell the note. Now you don't have to worry about it, right? And the math is really compelling. So it's it's there's all different ways to look at it, but I think that you, dear listener, need to look at your business and really know clearly where you're, where what phase of the business you're at and what your business is and focus on it. If you're just starting out, your business is really marketing and marketing. You're marketing through mailing, you're getting a property, and then you're marketing to sell the land, and that's your constraint, is having that skill set of doing that. And then the next rung up is team. How do I do this so I can live like Tate Litchfield and I can go cycling in the morning? And my biggest problem is the existential question of how much is enough, right? And I have team and systems and processes so I can get to that next rung. And that next rung is asset management. How do I get more properties? How do I help more people to Scott Bossman's phrase and continue doing that? Because at some point, we all run out of money. So you just go through those three runs. And then again, you still have to have the existential question of how much is enough and and do that. And so at some point, you'll hit that wall and you'll hit that next level of the video game and it won't be fun for you. So what? Then it's a whole different podcast of like, do I push or do I pivot? We can talk about that another time. All right. I thought this is really good. And uh, a good a good uh, discussion, but we're now at that point in the podcast where we're going to pick on Kirk and ask him for his tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actual for the auto passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. But before he gives that tip, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can transform your life. Start building that passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents, but do it safely and efficiently with our coaching team guiding you. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call and see if we can help get you to where you are now, to where you want to be with your passive income goals. I know what you're thinking. What about the tuition? It ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed you're going to make back that money 180 days or less. Just show us you're doing the work. Again, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. By the way, Kirk, I'm not even reading from a script and just saying this. I just know this stuff now from the top of my head. That's what happens when you 50,000 podcasts. Kirk, what is your tip of the week? <laughs> uh, okay. So um, I don't know if this is a tip so much, but uh, just talking about where my interests and attention are. And I think it's sort of um, where a lot of things are happening right now. There's definitely, I feel like, I mean, you know, there's just a lot happening in artificial intelligence right now. So I've been severely geeking out on all of the keynotes. So the keynotes from NVIDIA, the keynote from Apple, there's a there's so much coming to the market with AI. Um, so I feel like it's just good to get as much information as possible, let it settle, and then we see where we go, but definitely don't want to be left behind. Some of the things that are coming out right now, like, there, the conveniences that are going to be created with AI are just going to be out of this world, right? And I think the application to our to our business, you know, to be able to even make things three percent more efficient, five percent more efficient, ten percent more efficient with zero effort, just because we know what's what's coming, right? Um, 
I think that there's definitely, you know, definitely a great opportunity there. So that's where I've been spending the last week or so. I literally just sat down in front of YouTube and watched and the, the, the CEO of NVIDIA for three hours. You know, I'm about to dive into, I watched the synopsis of uh, Apple's release, uh, their WWDC. And also I have a background in software engineering. So this stuff just naturally interests me as well. But um, yeah, you know, I think to be able to do things like create images just by typing some text into a, into a prompt and, hey, give me these images for my land so I can put them in, in, in the marketing advertisement, those kinds of things. There, there's a lot that is coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I think it's just, you know, it's going to get better. But yeah. right now, in my workflow, it's a really good intern. Like, it's a really great start, and it gets me 75% of the way there. But I, there's, I'm still not ready to ship any of the work that it's, it's giving me uh, at all. But I can imagine a day where it will be ready to ship. And then it gets really interesting as far as, well, if you're not an entrepreneur, what job are you going to have? And then it gets, you know, a little bit scary. I mean, you know, does NVIDIA and Apple and, and Google and Amazon, I mean, do we do like universal basic income because nobody really has a job anymore. And then it's like, okay, there's people that are creating value. And then there's people who are just living like Tate. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it'll be interesting, but I do think that as or do, does as everybody have, become an artist? Right, like no, that's yeah, this is a new renaissance. Time. Yeah, it's a new right. re- a new renaissance time. We all become artists and poets, and but that's the thing is, um, if AI is doing it better, and in, in, even in the art world, um, I don't know. It's 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 fun to speculate. I think you know what it is. I've been reading a Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and I read mm-hmm. uh, we. I've been reading these dystopian novels, so I'm like in this like bad headspace. I, I have a feeling, though, that I'll be completely wrong about this. And in, in, in artificial intelligence could be the greatest thing for humanity. And, you know, our our kids and grandkids will look back at what have we suffered through the ages <laughs> of what we had to do and, uh, and, and, and how amazing their lives are and, uh, and all that. So, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I mean... It- I think it's pretty cool, right? Like either way, we're at an apex inflection point and there's going to be interesting things that come from it. It's just kind of cool to see it happen. Even if you're just not looking to use it in your business, but you can see that changes are coming and it's going to be really interesting. No, for sure. I even like just the the uh, email AI piece in, in like Apple's going to bake that in just just for writing better because I can't yeah. tell you how many times hate box me me. I'm like, bro. I know you didn't lose. You didn't use Grammarly on this, and now it's just going to be baked <laughs> in because that's like an extra step. So it, it's fantastic. It's yeah, fantastic. Grammar's well, a nice strong suit. Yeah, and and you know what? And every everyone who's who says that and thinks that right now, it will be. Yeah, and no one will know. But that's how you know you got right. the real Tate Litchfield, Mark. That's right. That's, That's how right. you know the AI avatar. Build. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Tate sent me this. He misspelled there and there. He didn't know which one to use. <laughs> yeah. Because why would we yeah, have but... two words that are both spelled almost identically but mean different things in different instances and when you use them? How does that how does that make sense? Yeah. No, I mean th- my when I write my uh weekly like thoughts, I use AI PRM. I have I have my prompt already written out. I you do a couple prompts. It gives me a really good first draft. I take that first draft. I edit it in Grammarly, and it's you know what used to take maybe an hour to write now it takes maybe twenty minutes. Mm. It's it's pretty incredible, actually. So imagine a day where it only takes me five minutes. Imagine a day just it just writes in my tone and style because I've trained it. It's coming. Mm-hmm. It's here. But um, all right. Well. Kirk, are we good? Absolutely, Mark. Dude, buddy. Great. Landon. We're good. Big Papa. You guys on the other side.
All right. I want to thank the listeners. Remind you, the only way we're going to be able to continue to get Kirk to come up with these great tips of the weeks, tips of the week, is we do three things. Three things. Follow, rate, review the podcast, send a screenshot of that review, support at blanket.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. All right. We ready to do this? One, two, three. Let, 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 let freedom, 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 freedom ring. 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 That was abysmal. <laughs> that was completely <laughs> abysmal. The last word that but, was ring. Yeah. <laughs> but by the way, speaking of uh, AI, so I started writing Dirt Rich too, how to scale your land business. Like the plot thickens, how to scale your land business without skipping a beat. And I'm just like now almost ready to, to publish it. And I'm going through it. I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I like, I have to have written, I, I had to write chapter after chapter about artificial intelligence and how, because like, I wanted to stay uh, evergreen, and like just thinking about how much has changed is incredible with these mm-hmm. things. Uh, is really interesting. But um, all right, we were just talking about top shows for the summer. If you had to, if you had to just you know, give one show recommendation that you've been watching for someone to watch this summer. What would you, what would be Kirk? Uh, well, no, I talked about dark matter earlier, which is cool, but I, my wife and I, we had just started watching this series on Netflix. I think it's Netflix killing Eve. Um, oh, I've seen killing Eve. It, that was a, was that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. It's, we still, we were like, oh, we just want to watch something just to see it, you know, just to have something to watch. There's four seasons. We'll watch it whenever we are. We In two days, we blasted through the first season and we're on to halfway through the second season. So we got sucked in. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Nice. Nice. Dude, buddy. Uh, well, I don't watch a lot of shows, but... Um... My son is home for the summer, and he and I enjoy Curb Your Enthusiasm. So we saw and watched all the seasons. We're on season eight right now. Season, uh, so a few more seasons to go. We're hoping to get them all in all this summer. I don't know if we're going to be able to or not. Uh, and then, of course, i got to take in the, any Star Wars uh, show that's on, you know? Right. Pretty, 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 pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, Landon, I love him. what about love you? Show? So we're stuck on, and this is kind of, I guess it's kind of old. It's uh, Your Honor um, on Netflix. Oh, yeah. I think it's, oh, yeah. It was on Showtime, but yeah. We're just, we're locked into this thing. I mean, we're binge watching it. It's, it's, it's pretty deep and it's pretty good and just keeps switching up on you all the time. And that, we love that. So, um, you know, there's a land geek that stars in Your Honor, remember? He had a that's what Mark Honor. was telling me, and I Paul had Flanagan. no idea. I went back to Paul look at him, I like, no way. Yeah, first Amazing. episode, he's, he's, he's Exciting dealing stuff. with Brian Cranston. That yeah. Is, yeah, pretty cool. So, yeah, I went back and looked him up. I was like, no way. There, there he is. So, pretty yeah. sweet, pretty sweet. Um, and then I'm starting to watch, just kind of peeked at it. I like I like Western. I don't know. I'm just like a guy. Um, it's called like uh, a million ways to die in the West. Um, it's a, well, I, I just started, so I don't even really know if it's that good, but won a few Emmys. So it can't be that bad. So. Wow. A million ways to die in the West. Okay, cool. Yeah. Jay. Um, well, I, I haven't started it, but today the Netflix documentary on the Tour de France was released and I watched a trailer on it recently. And so that's going to be awesome. So it's called, I think, Unchained, something like that. So as soon, as soon as you said Tour de France, I started to drool like I was falling asleep. You know, how you like go into a deep sleep and you're like drooling. <laughs> that's fair enough. Fair enough. I got no, rebut- no rebuttal, but uh <laughs> <laughs> this is mini bite size, so it's only like you'll get a mini nap out of it, twenty to thirty minutes at a time. But supposed to be really good and really exciting. Uh, we also started uh, Fallout, which has been. But by, by the way, do they, they do they test you? Do they test your blood after you watch that Netflix documentary? <laughs> <laughs> you can only hope that you got those gains just from watching TV. Yeah. yeah. So that, that Fallout, and uh, I haven't started it, but I will watch the Tour de France documentary. 
series. So that's what All I'm right. at. Awesome. Um, what what show am I watching? I I don't watch a lot of NBA. So yeah. Yeah. the the finals are now. Um, yeah. So have I, have I gotten into any shows? I, you know what I watch? I just like the just mindlessly flick through trailers. I recommend the trailers. <laughs> I do. I, do I know. And then I try to think, ah, is this really going to be worth too. my time? And then I've been watching a lot of YouTube, just videos on AI. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's been a lot of fun because there's just, there's, it's just endless, just endless. Mm-hmm. So, um, and of course, reading dystopian novels. So as I, as far as a show, um, to be continued, I'm, I, I have to find one and it's different from one of yours, but I'm trying to think what have I watched lately that, Oh, I know on HBO Axe. I really enjoyed Hacks. Have you guys seen that? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's on Max. It's about an older woman who is a stand-up comedian, and she hires, uh, I don't know if she's a millennial or Gen Z. She's young, way younger and woke and working for this, this woman in Vegas, and she doesn't want to be there, and you see their dynamic. It is fantastic writing. I recommend Hacks on Max. All right. Well, this is fun. See you guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.